Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the public health mitigation of COVID-19 and adherence, an adherence challenge webinar. Uh, my name is Jennifer Schaefer and I will be your WebEx host. Before I turn today's present over to Mike Sterrett, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. All attendees have been muted upon entry and will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A or chat panel and select all panelists from the drop down. We will ask them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of the webinar following today's presentation. If you need closed captioning, please refer to the link that will appear in the chat panel. The webinar is being recorded. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike to introduce our speaker. Jennifer, thank you so much. And greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mike Starrett. Uh, I'm a senior behavioral scientist at the Division of AIDS Research at the NIMH, and I'm also the co-chair for the NIH Adherence Network. The NIH Adherence Network is a consortium of 14 NIH institutes, centers, and offices that provides leadership, vision, and support to strengthen adherence research. And on behalf of the network, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. William Riley, as our Adherence Network Distinguished Speaker from our Adherence Network Distinguished Speakers Lecture. The, uh, Dr. Riley has served now as the NIH Associate Director for Behavioral and Social Sciences Research and Director of the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, the OBSSR, for five years. Before his current NIH appointment, Dr. Riley worked in a number of leadership roles at NIH, uh, including uh, at the NIMH, NHLBI, and NCI. Dr. Riley's training is in psychology and sociology, and he received his doctorate in clinical psychology from the Florida State University, and his clinical psychology internship was done at Baylor College of Medicine. Before joining NIH, he held faculty appointments at the Medical College of Georgia and at Virginia Commonwealth University, and he also directed PIX, Inc., which is a private research and development firm. Dr. Riley currently holds an appointment as a professional lecturer in the School of Public Health at the George Washington University. His research interests include behavioral assessment, psychosocial health factors, uh, and the application of technology, engineering, and computer science methodologies to preventive health behaviors, chronic disease management, and medication adherence. His talk today is titled, Public Health Mitigation of COVID-19, an Adherence Challenge, and we welcome him. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Mike and Janet, um, and all the Adherence Network for inviting me today. It's uh, really nice to be able to um, speak to people who are like-minded. Um, um, Mike will tell you that adherence is near and dear to my heart and the research that is done in the adherence um, space is important. So um, I wanted to take this time to spend a little bit of time talking with all of you about um, the adherence challenges from COVID-19, which I'm sure many of you will have a pretty good sense of already. But just to give you a sense of some of the key areas and some of the things that are going on, and toward the end, um, some of the initiatives that NIH is launching um, to help sort of address some of those issues as we move forward. Um, so we all sort of think this, if only adherence could be achieved by telling people what to do. Um, but of course, that is pretty much what we're doing under COVID-19. We're telling people what to do. Um, and in a blog back in March, I wrote uh, that the deal that we make as behavioral and social scientists with our infectious disease colleagues is you tell me what you need people to do, and I'll tell you how to help them do it. Um, and so there's a step beyond just telling people what to do, obviously, that tends to be sort of our primary thing that's done in public health in ways that we could um, improve upon that to mitigate the transmission of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So if you go to the CDC website, there are four key things. There are a few others that are related to it, but four key things that we ask everybody to do in the current pandemic. Wash your hands often, avoid close contact, otherwise known as physical distancing. Cover your mouth and nose with a face mask, which we didn't initially ask them to do, but we subsequently did, which caused a little confusion. Because people weren't sure, were we not doing it initially because we didn't think it was that effective or because we wanted to make sure we had masks for all the um, direct healthcare service providers. But 
In any case, that's now the way we, we speak about it in terms of doing it. And the last one was to stay home if you're sick. Um, so I want to kind of touch on each of those from an adherence perspective and talk a little bit about um, what we know, what we don't know, um, and then some approaches as we think forward about that. But before I do that, we can still tell them better than we currently do what to do. Um, and so I, I was really taken by this a recent article by London colleagues. Um, it's in the Journal of Behavioral and Policy, um, and I can't remember what the A stands for now off the top of my head, um, but just a, a nice sort of piece just on how understanding behavioral science can help us fight the coronavirus. And then the communication part of it, they were talking about the importance of a sort of best for all you know, strong group identity and these communication efforts. Um, and it's been particularly important in situations in which um, people at lower risk of serious illness from uh, the coronavirus um, are still potential carriers of it and then subsequently carriers to people who are at higher risk. And so being able to increase that sort of sense of group identity and we're all in it together um, is an important component of, of what we need to do. Um, Sally Jenkins, in an article this morning in the Washington Post, um, said that one of the pandemic or epidemics that we were having to deal with um, was American. And I, now I think it basically came, it was essentially our sort of independent mind thinking, right? That we, we do whatever we want to do. Um, and as opposed to any sort of group collective sort of way of thinking about the way we ought to work with one another. And we've been trying to do that, I think, as a public health effort, but that's been important. And then, of course, in any sort of crisis risk communication, um, speed or rapidity, honesty, credibility, empathy, and promoting useful and specific individual actions are all sort of important components to that. Um, I, I, I can't help but think through um, most of the things that I've seen on TV and wondered how much or how little we've done those things. Um, to give people information quickly, to do it in an honest way, to do it in a credible way, to do it with some sense of empathy of how hard it is to do these things, and then promoting specific actions. And I'm just gonna give you one example from the hand washing area. Almost everybody knows this, that we want people to wash their hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. That's been, I think, said enough times in enough ways in enough different settings that most people would say, okay, I got it, right? Now, most people don't, they underestimate how long 20 seconds is. Um, and in many cases, um, we have little, you know, helpful rubrics like, you know, sing happy birthday to yourself twice. That'll probably get you through it. Um, but, but beyond that, most people don't know much um, in terms of exactly when to do that. And I even among this group um, who are clearly uh, much more knowledgeable and educated if I asked you, what's the list of CDC recommendations for when you should wash your hands? I think all of us would probably have a hard time knowing those. When in truth, for something as serious as this pandemic, it should be a recurring, regular communication that is so explicit and so clear that everybody should know this list, right? So here's the list, all right? Before you eat or prepare food, before touching your face, after leaving any public place, after blowing your nose, coughing or sneezing, after leaving the bathroom, after handling your face mask covering, that one, by the way, is one I have a particular hard time doing, um, after changing a diaper for those of you who have infants, um, after caring for someone who is sick, or after touching pets and animals. Um, those are the recommendations that the CDC provides about when you should wash your hands um, under the, in the current pandemic. So the first piece of this is to keep in mind that, yes, knowledge is not the sufficient condition, but it's clearly the necessary condition. Unless people know these things and know them specifically about when they're supposed to engage in the behavior, they're obviously not likely to be able to do it. The other thing that's pretty clear from this list as you look at it, any of you who have been Pavlovian trained, and I don't mean Pavlovian trained as in you actually have been done uh, classical conditioning, but you've actually learned classical conditioning um, as part of your training, um, will know that all of these look um, awfully like, like stimuli for which you could produce a conditional response of hand washing, especially the things that are sort of after leaving public places. And you'll notice as you've walked around that in some places, 
there's a lot more prompts to uh, wash your hands after certain sorts of things. But again, one of the things that I think we haven't done adequately as a public health communications effort is help people with that basic understanding of how to develop a habit, how to produce a conditional response to these stimuli. And so even simple things like telling people to put a little sign up in their bathroom that reminds them to wash their hands as they're leaving or, um, you know, something on their face mask that as they take it off at the back of it says, wash your hands or, you know, all these little things like this that are simple sort of prompts that would lead toward a more conditional response over time are the sort of things that I think we need to be thinking more about and giving people more information about as we do this. Now, hand washing for us has actually been an area in which we know a fair amount about adherence um, because hand washing has been a critically important um, public health hygiene effort for many, many years. Um, we know that mass media communications will increase hand washing. Uh, that's mostly been tested in low and middle income countries, um, mostly for concerns about uh, diarrheal diseases, um, but um, still pretty clear, especially whether it's TV or uh, mobile text messaging or those types of things that mass media sort of just basic reminders about when to wash your hands increase the likelihood of hand washing. We know that accessibility at point of use um, is also important, whether that's hand washing states, stations and prompts to do that, especially again in low and middle income countries where there's not easy accessibility at point of use um, to be able to engage in these behaviors. Um, also, the more important reason for why um, we need to be thinking about this, and we'll talk a little bit more in a bit about health inequities and how COVID-19 has produced that, especially in rural areas and some areas where just the simple accessibility that most of us take for granted that there are washrooms with soap and that sort of thing available in all of these places isn't true. Um, in a number of countries and even in some areas of our own country for being able to do that, which is a simple but important thing to be able to increase. Um, we know that increased accessibility, this is in um, hospital settings now. So we, there's been basically two kind of large efforts around hand washing adherence. One has been in low and middle income countries, primarily uh, for public health efforts to uh, reduce or prevent diarrheal diseases and pneumonia control. And the second has been obviously a large amount of effort that's been done in hospital systems, primarily to get hospital staff um, to increase hand washing behavior over time. And some of that research that you know, those of you who have seen it, it's, it's scary how little hand washing actually goes on um, in most hospital systems um, and how much we need to stay on top of that among staff so it becomes a regular habitual behavior for them at each point in care where they're supposed to do it. Now, so, if you look at that hospital um, hand washing adherence literature, there's increased accessibility at point of care and prompts to do it have been effective. But there's also an interesting kind of line of research there about regular performance feedback being important, being able to tell people after the fact how well they're doing, how well their unit's doing, how well their unit's doing relative to other units in the hospital. That type of research has also shown in a, a positive effect of adherence from doing that regular performance feedback. And once again, we don't have that kind of control in a large mass community setting of the type of hand washing adherence that we're trying to achieve in COVID-19. But we once again could provide people with ways to actually do that as a self um, management approach um, to be able to give regular performance feedback, uh, particularly probably true with children, being able to give them performance feedback on when we've noticed that they've washed their hands or done those types of things as part of being at home. Um, we also know social norms and the perception that the behavior will prevent infection um, is associated with um, increased hand washing behavior as well. So there's a number of things that we've learned primarily from um, hospital based hand washing adherence and from more um, mass community based public health adherence, mostly in low and middle income settings, our country settings that have given us, I think, a really nice sort of basis on which we could build better hand washing adherence programs um, in the midst of COVID-19 and also study them um, and evaluate them in the current situation. So like I said, the, the, the challenge that we have is that there's very little um, hand washing adherence research that occurs either outside the hospital system or outside of low and middle income country settings. And very little, of course, during global pandemics, which from my perspective means 
this is an opportunity for us to understand better how to improve adherence to these types of mass efforts to engage people in increasing the hand washing that they do as they move forward. The other is the one that um, I know that people on the adherence network know all too well, which is our measurement issues with adherence. We know that self-report actually overestimates the actual adherence to hand washing. It's been shown that's been shown in a number of studies. We can do direct observation or even more virtual sort of observations now that we have some sensor technologies and directly observed therapies and those types of things for some types of um, types of uh, adherence. But we're still in a situation there where we have reaction and Hawthorne effects that might impact that. There's been some interesting um, work just looking at the speed in which soap use in public facilities increases um, as a result of some of the um, interventions being used, which is a nice way to sort of measure indirectly whether people are washing their hands more. The same would be true of sort of water flow and that sort of thing. And there's been a few studies that actually use sort of bacterial scans of the hands um, at various spot checks and times to see how well people are controlling at least bacterial sort of infections on their hands. Um, as a result of this. So I think we have some emerging and important ways that we can measure adherence better to hand washing. Um, and we need to be considering those as we think about future research moving forward. Okay. Um, let me talk about adherence to physical distancing. Uh, we know much less about this. This isn't the first time that we've engaged in physical distancing um, at, at, a, at a mass effort like this. Um, to mitigate an epidemic. Uh, we did so with the Spanish flu. We actually even did so back in biblical times with leprosy. Um, but of course, nobody was doing research about physical distancing efficacy or adherence either during the 1918 flu or in other situations like that. So uh, we have very little experience with it and almost no research on how to improve adherence to physical distancing. There are some things we do know just about physical distancing and you'll notice and I should, I should note here that I, I didn't have the time to put links into all of these um, references, but they're easy to find. If you Google Anderson 2020 and physical distancing, you'll, you'll find it pretty easily. But, and I'll only put in the first author, not all the authors, but it gives you at least a quick idea of where to find some of these references. We know that physical distancing is effective for reducing transmission. It's been shown in a number of studies, both modeling studies and actual um, studies on some of the things going on with uh, COVID-19 now. All of these are 2020 studies. Um, all of them obviously have been since March. It's been amazing how quickly um, the publication efforts have um, changed and the speed with which we publish has changed. And some of these are actually being pulled from um, the um, archives, psych archive, um, some of the med archive, some of the sort of pre-peer reviewed publication sort of places. Um, as we try to get information out quickly about what we've learned um, about COVID-19 as we move forward. So we know that physical distancing is effective for reducing transmission. And in some cases, it appears to be probably the most effective thing we can do to reduce the transmission of, of the coronavirus. Um, we wouldn't probably tell people this in any mass um, public health effort, but uh, we know that two meters is a pretty good um, space, uh, that six feet mark. Um, but one meter is also protective. So um, even at smaller distances, um, there's protective effects um, as opposed to being much closer than that. Um, we know that it's the, um, the WHO and the European Union would like to make sure we call it physical distancing, not social distancing, um, because people can still socially interact. They just have to do so virtually and, and at a distance. Um, but we have to remember that there are strong social reinforces for physical proximity, hugging, touching, my favorite, which is slapping someone on the back. All of those are things that are important as social reinforces of that physical connection, right? And so we're asking people to not engage and to not have those social reinforcers made available to them. And that undermines their adherence to physical distancing. So we have to be thinking a little bit more clearly about how do we provide that reinforcement in such a way that they still feel like they get some of the benefits of, of physical closeness and physical proximity from those social reinforcers um, without them having to actually be physically um, close to one another to do so. And then of course, this has exacerbated um, disparities um, because um, there are living conditions that um, 
facilitate being able to follow physical um, distancing and some that do not. Um, we've all been sitting here um, in our, our own little um, bubble, um, being able to virtually do this. Um, and many of us can telework. Um, those who are in the lower SES groups are predominantly in jobs where they can't telework, where they have to go into work in order to get a paycheck um, and are regularly um, exposed to the possibility of contracting the virus as a result of that. So um, those these living conditions and a number of other aspects of that are an important component to recognize in terms of um, trying to help people with physical distancing. There's been very little, as I've said, about um, to date about sort of adherence to physical distancing. Um, there was a paper that talked about three pillars, and I think they're probably important, but um, they may not be all modifiable sort of factors. One, there actually always has to be a little bit of fear that sort of drives the behavior, and I think that's been some of what's driven what adherence to physical distancing we've seen in people is the fear of actually contracting the virus. Um, there's um, the role of sort of being pro-social, being concerned about others and, and that sort of thing as being an important component and then how well people generally follow the rules. There's been one study that shows that empathy is associated with adherence to physical distancing. So the more empathic people are of others in their um, situation and that type of thing, the more likely they are to adhere, which once again both goes back to that communication effort that, that we talked about at the beginning in which um, we make sure that empathy is a component of what we do as we communicate the importance of physical distancing and other um, behaviors. And then a belief in science is associated with physical distancing. This is an interesting study by Brzezinski and, and colleagues in which they looked at um, on a, uh, I think country by country basis, sort of beliefs about climate change and whether it was real and that sort of thing. And then beliefs about physical distancing and whether it was necessary. And those two things are obviously correlated. So um, belief in sort of the, the, the data available from science and what it means is an important component of this as well. Okay, face mask use. Um, so we do have some prior research that shows there's limited adherence to face mask wearing in households with children with respiratory illness and with influenza. Um, so we know that this is problematic. Um, it's amazing to me, the McIntyre study, this is, um, and those of you who do adherence research um, know these, um, these studies probably all too well. They're the ones that always shock people to realize that these are parents with children with a respiratory illness in which wearing a mask is important for their children's sake. And about half of those parents don't adhere to face mask wearing um, while in the presence of their children who have a respiratory illness. Um, they're the type of things that always surprise us. I still remember the Sackett and Holmes um, um, book from many years ago and that after people had lost sight in one eye, they still didn't use glaucoma drops in the other eye. Um, about half of them didn't. So it's always amazing, I think, especially for lay people, how much non-adherence occurs. Um, and that in some cases, non-adherence is the rule and adherence is the exception, not the other way around. Um, we know among healthcare workers um, who wear face masks, that availability of it, of those face masks, training in how to use them correctly, group norms about that others are also doing it, sort of the peer sort of normative um, structure, that sort of thing, organizational support for doing so, and communication are all associated with increased face mask use. So we can draw from what we know about adherence to face mask use among hospital employees and healthcare workers and extrapolate some of those things to be able to do this among the more general population. There's minimal research though in ep epidemics. Um, we know, and this is just you know the health belief model, um, perceived risk and the serious of the illness are predictors of whether people will use face masks or not. Um, and last, before I leave this, there was an interesting study that was recently published that was interesting because they, it's, it's one of those old Confederate studies where um, they basically stood in line at queues of various places in Germany um, and they either wore a face mask or didn't wear a face mask. And they did that both before there was a, a specific sort of edict to do so versus after. Um, and the, one of their questions was, as a result of people wearing face masks, would that produce some risk compensation so that people would not physically distance as much? It turns out they actually physically distance more as a result of that study. Um, that people, if you see people wearing a face mask, you actually physically distance from them a little bit more. 
And again, probably because it's a nice sort of reminder that, you know, there is the potential of sort of um, uh, respiratory transmission. Um, and as a result, people sort of use that reminder to remind them to stay more physically distant. Um, but interesting study that, that those two things can actually work together um, to be more useful. Um, I wanted to finish with something we actually know a fair amount about, um, and that's um, how to help people stay home when they're sick. And you've probably heard this many times from various people and various public health officials, that if you're sick, you should stay home. And that is an important component of what we're doing. The problem is, is that in, our, in the US, it's still the case that we're one of the few developed countries without guaranteed paid sick leave. Um, about two thirds of workers go to work when they're sick with the flu or other contagious diseases. I remember that when we finally get back to work after there's a vaccine for COVID-19, um, your coworkers are still probably coming um, to work with some other contagious disease somewhere along the way. And that right now, and this has changed gradually, it used to be around 60%, then 50, and now the more recent research, about 40% of US workers have no paid sick leave benefit. The people who don't, once again, this is the health disparities issue. They're younger, they're female, they're Hispanic, they're less educated, and they're mostly blue collar or farm workers. They're less, less likely to have paid sick leave. And then as a result, if you ask someone to stay home, but the result of having to stay home is that you lose pay, um, and all likely the people are more likely um, to still go to work under those circumstances. That disparity also exists globally in global research on um, paid sick leave. Um, the same sort of disparities occur uh, across countries. Modeling research has consistently shown a reduction in the spread of contagious diseases and economic benefits from paid sick leave. Um, there's decades of research that paid sick leave is an important component of pandemic mitigation. And I particularly wanted to cite you, most of you have seen on TV many times being interviewed since this pandemic began, Tom Inglesby. Back in 2006, he and the colleagues wrote a, a really nice paper about the things we needed to do to prepare for a future pandemic. One of them was paid sick leave. Um, and, you know, if people at any, at any point in time say we weren't adequately prepared, we didn't know, we, we did know. We just didn't read the literature. We didn't understand it well enough. Um, one of the things that um, I, I was particularly surprised by um, I probably shouldn't have been surprised, but I was surprised by, is that even though this literature, including uh, Tom's articles and others, have been out there about paid sick leave and the importance of it, early on in the pandemic, it was governors of the states talking to the White House task force that eventually um, produced paid sick leave being part of one of the initial bills that came out. And it was a temporary paid sick leave bill to allow people to be able to stay home when sick. The literature was already was actually part of what we needed to do. Um, some other interesting sort of things about paid sick leave, um, three times more likely to forego medical care without paid sick leave and preventive care, and that includes flu vaccination. So as we begin to think forward about um, vaccination for the coronavirus, the same likely possibility exists that people with paid sick leave are going to be more likely to get vaccinated than those who are not. Um, so we also know that that, tempor that temporary federal mandate, which was enacted on April the 1st, has already had a positive effect on staying home more. Um, that was a study actually looking at, the Anderson study was a study looking at um, sort of some of the mobile um, geographic location data and about the degree to which people kind of move from home and work and that sort of thing. But there's been some changes in that as a result. Um, and I'll just leave you with two um, if you want to know more about sort of the importance of paid sick leave as a, um, it's an important component of our efforts. Um, uh, this article by Heyman on protecting health during COVID-19 beyond a global examination of paid sick leave design in 193 countries um, is a really nice um, article sort of describing what's going on with COVID on a country by country basis. And prior to that, there was a World Health Report on the case for paid sick leave that's a really nicely well done overview of all the reasons why um, the United States more generally should have paid sick leave um, as a, a benefit of people who are working. And, oh, and, and also for 
Um, one of the arguments in that that I think is important is that there's also data to show that there's economic benefit to the employers um, who provide paid sick leave. Um, as a result of the fact that if they don't, then more people get sick from contagious diseases. They actually have more um, people out sick over the course of time if they not if they don't provide it than if they do. Okay. I want to shift gears for a few minutes and update all of you about some of the things that are going on with COVID-19 um, at the NIH that are related to some of the adherence um, work that we just talked about. One of the first things that we could do quickly at the NIH was to put out um, competitive and administrative supplement notices, uh, notices of uh, scientific interest um, uh, for existing um, grantees to expand what they were currently doing to include specific coronavirus COVID-19 uh, related research. And so a number of institutes put those out very quickly, as did um, OVSSR put out a trans NIH one as well, primarily to make sure we covered any of the gaps that any of the specific ICs didn't cover and to allow some of the other institute and centers to be able for their grantees to be able to actually come in with supplements as well. So I think we've covered the lay of land with the supplement. Um, work fairly well, um, a list of the ones that we thought were behaviorally and socially science oriented are found at the OBSSR website, both um, ours as well as others, if you're interested in looking at any of those. And they cover a pretty broad range of research that's possible. Um, one that I don't think, and again, this is why I wanted to, to um, uh, accept doing this presentation today and wanted to make sure that we kind of got the word out about this, is that I don't think we've done enough research on adherence to mitigation strategies and being able to get a better sense of how can we improve how well people adhere to these various mitigation strategies. But there's also um, calls for research in these various supplement um, calls for mitigation risk reduction, how much uh, risk reduction occurs from these various mitigation efforts, some of the costs, the economic impacts and the social impacts of uh, engaging in these mitigation efforts, some of the downstream health impacts that occurred, both in terms of decreased access to healthcare, as well as um, subsequent um, just substance abuse, mental health, and some of the other things that we've seen um, during economic um, downturns like this, people losing their job, obviously. Um, and then interventions that might ameliorate some of those impacts, um, things addressing healthcare access, um, especially the limited access that was occurring um, in the early stages of this when hospitals were overwhelmed mostly with COVID patients. And then obviously a lot of potential natural experiments that can be done looking county by county, state by state, looking at differences in when these various sort of um, policies were implemented and what their impacts were on these things. So. Um, all of that's available for people to look at. We also quickly realized that um, although we would like to have one set of hard, uh, harmonized COVID-19 measures that um, the um, horse had already left the barn, that people were already um, fielding questions by the time we thought that we really needed to even think about harmonization of all those survey questions. So instead of trying to come up rapidly with some consensus harmonization, we instead so just make your surveys public, post them, allow us to post them at the NIH and, and get it out there so that other people can use what you've already developed and make it less likely that there'll be one-off surveys over and over again asking same or similar questions about COVID-19. So on two platforms, um, the DR2 website, the Disaster Response Research website, and the Phoenix Toolkit website, both have made all of these survey protocols, survey um, instruments available to anyone. Um, so if you go to any of those sites, you'll be able to find them there. As we've been working on this repository, we've been able to sort of organize it better, organize it by type and topic areas and those types of things. Um, some stuff that's being done already in nationally representative samples, which allows you to link to some of those, some of that work as you move forward. So these are also, I think, useful resources to um, not create surveys anew, not create new survey items anew, but before you do that, to look at this resource and see what's already out there that could be asked so that you don't have to do that. And you can at least link to these other studies that are ongoing at this point. Right now, there's over 70 surveys that have been posted. 
Um, and I, I actually haven't updated the slide in a while. Um, I'm sure it's well over 20, 30, 40,000 downloads by now um, of these various sort of survey items as they're moving forward. So um, please avail yourself of that. I think that would be really helpful. Um, just a quick note about the appropriations for COVID-19 research. Um, the first round of funding uh, to the NIH was about 1.8 billion. It mostly went to NIAAD and NHLBI for therapeutics and vaccine development and research. And let me say, as the director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, I was extremely pleased that the priority for funding was for therapeutics and vaccine development, right? There are a lot of things that we need to also address on the behavioral and social science side, but I think we all know that the thing that will get us through this and out of this um, pandemic will be therapeutics that keep people survived and recovered um, as a result of getting the virus and a vaccine that prevents them from getting it in the first place. Um, so it's been really nice to see that amount of effort going into that and the speed and rapidity with which that work is being done has just been breathtaking to see um, from my perspective. I, I wish we could move that fast all the time, um, but we've certainly moved fast in that space. But um, that said, um, psychosocial recovery efforts um, are also included in those efforts, and it's been nice to see psychosocial recovery being part of what people are concerned about there. The second round of funding that we got, another 1.8 billion, um, was mostly for testing um, and improving our testing um, ability um, for the uh, virus as well as for the antibodies. And there's a substantial amount of that that went to NIBIB and NCI for virus antibody testing research, including platforms, the speed with which we do it, those types of things. But a large chunk of that money, 500 million, went to the RADx up effort for testing in underserved and vulnerable populations. So improving the access, improving the uptake, improving the interpretation, improving the sort of follow-up care, all of the things related to testing going on in underserved and vulnerable populations, for which, once again, adherence is going to be an important component of that. I'll remind us, I've mentioned earlier the health belief model. We have to remember that, that be, we developed that um, theory because we were doing tuberculosis um, screening and realized that convenience alone wasn't sufficient, that people, um, there were other factors other than convenience that were important, being able to get people to uptake screening and that sort of thing. So we need to do this here as well. That's also um, particularly been the case for HIV testing also. So um, all of you who are in the HIV space, your understanding and expertise in testing and uptake and interpretation and that sort of thing will be extremely valuable in trying to understand this as well. And then the third round of funding, um, which is still under consideration um, by Congress. As you know, there's a phase four stimulus package or phase 3.5, depends on how you count, um, that um, is, is in the works in Congress. And um, hopefully if the Republicans and Democrats can kind of begin to sort of find some um, common ground for agreement, um, there'll be a package in that. And in that will be additional funding as I, we currently understand it for more research. Um, and among those efforts will be, and I'll talk about this in just a second, some social, behavioral, and economic health impacts of the pandemic and its mitigation strategies. Right now, we have a little bit of money, 11 million, that was jumpstart money that the Office of the Director had for that, and I'll talk about that in a second. So that's been the funding that we've had. I've already talked about RADx up. These are um, initiatives that are currently out on the street. Um, we didn't want, um, for those of you who go, gosh, you know, I, I wish I already had, uh, you know, a large project like this underway because it doesn't look like I can get funding if I don't already have something. But the, the thing that was important to us, again, related to speed here was we wanted researchers who already were strongly engaged in research with their communities. Um, to be able to develop that de novo from scratch wasn't something we wanted to have or didn't have the time to do. Um, so the first two things that you see here are supplements to either NIH grantees for large scale networks uh, that have a large sort of community engaged relationship already ongoing, or are for individual research awards that have strong community collaborations and partnerships, and that could reach specifically underserved or vulnerable populations for COVID-19. But then in addition to that, um, there's a, a, an effort specifically on understanding the social, ethical, and behavioral implications of COVID-19 testing in its populations, and then of course a data um, coordination center 
um, to develop all of that. So all of those are out on the street now um, for people to apply to. Then, um, as I said before, one of the early things that um, came up as part of our NIH effort was the social, behavioral, and economic impacts of COVID-19. Um, there are already two initiatives um, out on the street now. One is more of a um, effort looking at community-based interventions um, that's a notice, that's a supplement, and then another one that's a new PAR um, for community interventions to address the consequences of COVID-19 and health disparity in vulnerable populations. Right now, we're doing that work and others from current support from existing NIH funds, including that 11 million jumpstart money from the OD that I previously talked about. Um, but we're hoping that we get some additional funding from the current stimulus bill that will allow us to build out more of that kind of work, including adherence to the mitigation efforts. Um, we may not be able to do so much to understand that in time to be able to address the current epidemic, but it'd be really nice to have really solid data about adherence to things like, or improving adherence to things like physical distancing and face mask use and hand washing and other things in a future epidemic that will probably come along sometime, hopefully uh, many, many years and after most of us are long gone, but um, at some point in the future. And finally, to finish up, um, you know, I feel like I've been chasing my tail, and I think most of us have in trying to catch up with what we need to know about this pandemic and about the virus and about how it spread and adherence to various sort of mitigation behaviors and that sort of thing. So I wanted to try to think ahead a bit about the ones that are coming down the pike, right? So one's improving and maintaining long-term adherence to mitigation behaviors, especially for physical distancing and face mask wearing. Um, I think we can do that now, and we've already seen what happens when people initially um, adhere to these public health sort of edicts and, and requests, and then subsequently over time that begins to deteriorate. And all of us who have done adherence research know that that's the case. It's just an issue of um, how do we help with the maintenance of that? And I think that's going to be an important component that we could do pretty quickly. How we communicate risk and continue adherence to mitigation in the context of better therapeutics and vaccines. Uh, again, I, HIV colleagues probably know this best of all, but as people, as the therapeutics become better, the vaccines um, come online, um, people are going to lessen, they're going to do the risk uh, compensation effort, and they're going to lessen the typical things that we still need for them to do in order to control this um, pandemic, especially in the early stages. Um, improving public health implementation of what we already know, um, and that's going to be some of the implementation science efforts that we need to take on. Medication adherence, the old traditional way of thinking about adherence is going to also be important um, as we think about therapeutics and as those therapeutics shift from being tr treatment mostly in hospitals to treatment post-hospitalization and in outpatient care. Um, and we're going to need to um, have some focus on adherence to that as well. Testing adherence and follow-up, as I mentioned. And then finally, um, to minimize vaccine hesitancy. Um, we, we already know from um, some polling data that only about half of the people in the United States um, expect that they will get the vaccine when it's uh, available. Um, and the other half either don't know or have already decided that it's just too risky and too chancy and they're not going to do it. And so we've got a lot of work to do on sort of vaccine uptake and hesitancy and adherence to um, those sorts of efforts as well. And some of that's built into the RADx up effort, but we're probably going to need to do more um, in order to be able to address that in a reasonable way. So I'll stop there. I know there's probably questions and I've been talking for quite some time. Um, here's all the contact information. If you need to reach me for any follow-ups, we don't um, get to during the question and answer period. But once again, uh, Mike, Janet, um, the Adherence Network, thank you for the opportunity of presenting. Thank you, Bill. Um, I know, Janet, you're going to be uh, leading the Q&A. We've had a lot of questions come in, so thank you for your participation. Uh, Janet, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Janet DeMore. I'm the Deputy Associate Director for the Healthcare Delivery Research Program at the National Cancer Institute, and I co-lead the Adherence Network with uh, Mike Starrett. 
Uh, before getting into the Q&A, I just want to uh, thank you, Bill, for a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was an impressive synthesis of the literature, and uh, you certainly gave us some sobering statistics to think about. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of work to do, as, uh, as you rightly pointed out. Thank you to all of our attendees for being here today. Uh, we have had a number of questions come through the chat. Uh, I'm going to start working through those questions. Uh, if something occurs to you, please feel free uh, to add it to the chat box and um, we'll, uh, we'll sort of get it on our list and try to work through as many of these as possible. Um, so, uh, Bill, I want to kick off uh, with this question. Uh, so, the um, the question is that uh, the CDC's crisis and emergency risk communication guidance highlights that the right, the importance of the right message at the right time for the right person. However, yeah. the rampant misinformation uh, in direct contradiction to this guidance affects adherence. And uh, we'd love your thoughts about how to overcome this. Yeah, yeah. Um... I, I won't say get rid of the politicians and the media, um, which would be the best way to do that. Well, I, I, I will say that I mean that part of part of our part of our problem right now. Part of it's a, a you know the divisiveness politically in our country. Part of it is um, the media sort of hype around sort of um, focusing on um, disagreements as opposed to areas of consistency and agreement. And of course, the media also has a hard time with um, just attention span, right? And so. You, we need to say some of these things as you, as the um, CDC has sort of clearly identified. You need to say them consistently and clearly over and over and over again. And after about the third or fourth time, the media loses interest and wants to move on to something else. So it's also hard um, with the media outlets to sort of keep that standard sort of message going. Um, I think the, you know our Surgeon General did that well. I think Fauci, Burks do that well. I think there are a number of sort of people who fit the mold of both sort of credibility and honesty, and people can trust them, and they say the same things over and over again because they know that's what's necessary. Um, but we do have an awful lot of people who um, want to move on to other things, want to focus on other issues, um, and and that clearly has been problematic, I think, for the for the effort. Um, and part of why I think the United States is in the current situation that it's in. Um, because we just haven't said, here's the one person you need to listen to. This is their job. They're going to tell you every day until everybody's doing it um, and, and be consistent with that. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um... So we had another uh, question, uh, this one about uh, vaccine uptake. Actually, we've had a couple of questions about vaccine uptake. I'll do my best to synthesize these. Um, so do, what are your thoughts on the role of behavioral science in promoting uh, COVID vaccine uptake? Uh, so, um, you know, I think we've all been reading about the increased rates of vaccine hesitancy, uh, even people who are uh, up to date on other vaccines. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, this is um, this is going to be a real challenge for us in the next six months. And, and I think um, Tony Fauci, I think, has tried to do a good job with this. It's just that the message isn't getting out as clearly. Um, you know, so we already have a vaccine hesitancy problem, right? That that and and misinformation that goes out. There's already misinformation out in the field now about a vaccine, even though no vaccines even been deployed, and we already have misinformation out about the vaccine. Um, so. Um, being able to proactively jump on that quickly, be able to target those that in misinformation and make adjustments, I think is an important component of what we need to do. And behavioral science can play a role in that. And there are um, a, a number of people, including Celia Choi at, at, um, at uh, NCI, who've been really involved in sort of that misinformation effort and sort of how do we improve our ability to address misinformation about vaccines and other types of approaches. Um, but, you know, the, the other part of that that I think is really important is um, that we have that general problem anyway, but now we're developing vaccines at a rapid pace. And what Tony and others have tried to communicate, but again, I don't think as well as we probably should be communicating it, is that we're not changing anything about how we develop vaccines or how we test vaccines. The only thing that we're doing to speed them up 
has been to pre-deploy, pre-develop, pre-manufacture vaccines at risk in the hope that if one of these becomes effective, we find that it's effective and find that it's safe. It will already have tens of millions of doses available to be able to deploy. Um, I think that's where the speed part is, and but people here, we're doing it quickly and they hear risk, right? And they hear, this is not something that, that we should be, I, I don't wanna be the first person. I, be, I have family members who say, I don't want to be the first person to get the vaccine. Um, I, you know, I don't know what to tell them other than, you know, we, we've had to sort of be clear about safety and efficacy and, you know, the value and the role. And again, I don't think we stress enough the role, not only for ourselves, but for others, for the other people that we love and we care about that are important to us. And that vaccination is, a, is not something that's an individual decision. It's a group decision um, that needs to be made. So, and again, I think I, I say all of that and they're, they're partly sort of pulled from what we know from prior research, partly pulled from personal experience. But I do think that we're gonna need to do some very rapid research about how do we improve um, uptake of vaccines and we need to do it now in order to be able to address this. And do you think it's needing tailored approaches to address um, uptake and adoption in, in underserved populations? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. The, you know, the, um, you know, it'd be really nice if we could do one size fits all because it would certainly help our implementation efforts if we could do that. Um, but you know, we have specific issues in Native American populations. We have specific issues in urban Black populations and Hispanic populations, um, rural populations. Um, you know, we're, we're going to need to think about how do we tailor messaging to each of these populations. We're also have to think about how to target and tailor to those most likely to be hesitant about vaccination. Um, and, you know, how do we do that and, and how do we uh, work to um, understand their concerns and address them in a way that would make them more likely to be vaccinated. Right. So, uh, you know, I think that there's a, a chance that the current uh, pandemic could last for many more months or even years. Uh, do you foresee a particular challenge about long-term persistence to uh, these different preventive behaviors that you were talking about? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and do we need particular strategies to really promote that long-term adherence, adherence? Yeah, yeah. So everybody that's um, on this webinar who has a behavioral and social science background at all knows that we're really good with short-term adherence and not particularly good at long-term adherence to just about anything um, that, we've, that we've worked on and that we've done. Um, you know, so there's, there's a, a general need for a better research on maintaining adherence to these behaviors over time. And I think particularly in this situation, once again, I mean, we could have all predicted that we would have short-term initial adherence and then a deterioration of it over time. I mean, anybody who's done adherence research knows that. You could have guessed it up front and ahead of time. Um, I think where we're still lacking is, and we even know what some of the associations and correlations are with that deterioration, but effective sort of strategies to keep that maintained over time. How do we do it? How do we keep it fresh? How do we modify our interventions so that they address that? I think that's research we still need to do in this area. And this pandemic, like the, the questioner says, is going to be with us for a while. It gives us the opportunity to actually study that. So we should take advantage. So, uh, you know, of course, one of the, the preventive behaviors is, is mask wearing. And, uh, you know, in this country, we don't have the same norms around, ma you know, wearing a mask when, when you're sick. And it's been, um, you know, it's been difficult to, to get used to. Do you have thoughts about the best ways to, you know, build those social norms for mask wearing and, uh, you know, kind of use those to convey the importance to, uh, you know, the public at large about how important wearing a mask truly is? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, modeling is an important component of it, but I'll, I will talk about people who should be modeling the behavior. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it, but, but that is, I mean, that's clearly sort of one part of it. And that's part of where the social norm gets built over time. Um, I've been out in California before uh, coming back here for a while. And, and even the difference from the East Coast to West Coast, or at least certainly the San Francisco area, um, I, I w was 
pretty comfortable with not wearing my mask in outside locations where there weren't many people around, hiking, walking around trails, that kind of thing. Um, but in the San Francisco area, people are wearing masks all the time everywhere. So I just, as a social norm, without thinking about it, just because I felt like I would be ostracized by everybody else for not doing it, started wearing a mask in those situations as well. Um, so I think, you know, there is this sort of social component of it that, you know, we can build it. And I think we've seen it being built um, a little bit more over time here. Um, but the questioner's right. I mean, the, the, the issue is, is that as opposed to especially some Asian countries where this is a very comfortable thing to do and they do it with some regularity, it's not. And I've been particularly dismayed that it's become a political statement. Um, it's just extremely disconcerting me that some people believe it's a way to show that they're independent and they, they'll do whatever the hell they want. And one way to show that is that they're not going to wear a mask. Um, which again, it, you know, I, I, I understand, I mean, part of what we have to do is, you know, social and behavioral scientists is understand that pers perspective. Um, but the other side of that is that we also need to train them that it's not, it's not an individual, right? You're not doing this for yourself, right? Face mask wearing is not to protect you, it's to protect other people from you. Um, and um, trying to build that sort of, again, sort of social cohesion, cohesion and sense of I'm doing this for other people, I think we need to do more of that. And we have some basic research from game theory and other types of things where we could pull some of that and try to use it in our communication strategies. So and we should probably be doing more of that. And what do we know about how the strength and consistency of our recommendations affect adherence? Um, well, we we know, um, I, I think, fairly well in, in other sort of public health efforts um, that um, clear, that consistent communication strategies um, increase adherence to those strategies. And we've, we've got enough data even now from the pandemic to know that certain types of approaches seem to work better than others across countries. So some countries are doing better, and even when you control for all the other possible confounds, some of what they're doing and how they're doing it works better than it works in the United States or vice versa, So, or even within states in the United States. Um, so we, we have, I think, some data now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hang our hat on that, right? I mean, I think... Once again, it's a necessary condition to have a consistent message that people are aware of what they're doing. But we also know that it's not a sufficient condition without, you know, the social norm components, without prompts, without feedback, without some type of effort to be able to increase performance of the behavior, not just knowledge that they're supposed to do it. Um, so uh, I see we're down to, uh, to our last two minutes. Uh, I'll just ask one more question. Uh, and then we'll close. Uh, so this question was how much, uh, so is OBSSR interested in researching these adherence questions in international settings, specifically um, uh, low and middle income countries versus in the US only? Yes, um, so not just OBSSR alone. I mean, obviously the Fogarty International Center um, and the NIH more broadly are interested in uh, researching these questions across. I mean, this is a global pandemic. Um, to research them only in the United States doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, that said, everybody knows that the NIH has a focus on funding, you know, U.S.-led research. Um, and so, you know, there are a few ways around that. Um, one is that, you know, people doing international research, you know, it's U.S.-led with, um, but in um, other countries um, that is being performed and done. And the other is by international researchers who can make the case that either the expertise that they have, or, and this particularly is important here, or the situation that, that for which they can access in their country only and not in the United States is an important component of that. And I think that's gonna be true about the pandemic. There are enough differences across countries and sort of how it's mitigated and how it's handled and how it's transmitted that you could make the case in certain low and middle income countries that this is so unique and different. This is the only place we can really study this. And I think that's gonna be an important piece of what we do. Well, thank you, Bill. I, again, thank you for your wonderful presentation and uh, willingness to answer questions. We are out of time for today. Uh, we didn't get through all the questions. Uh, if people have questions like to answer, may I contact you directly? Sure, they can, they can certainly email me and I'll respond. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again so much and thank you to everyone who uh, joined us today.
presentation today. Uh, with that, uh, the session is closed and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.